name is Paul Moore. I've been studying insects in other community college for over 50 years. Uh, as a youngster, I was gathering up insects and snails from a hobby. And then just by pure chance, I got a job with the Department of Agriculture as an entomologist, studying insects, both pests and beneficial uh, insects. So I have a fair breadth of knowledge. I work for environmental health as well, studying insects from all across the world, identifying what they are, can they do as any harm, uh, find stuff on foodstuffs and bananas or something like that. I'm the one who has to identify what it is and take it off the, the market. So I have about 70 odd slides here. We're going to go through. Hopefully we don't overrun time too much, but it might just happen. So um, do I share screen first or just to open the presentation? Anna? Uh, She's muted herself. No, I haven't. Ridiculous no. slide. Yes, no, no, certainly share the screen. And, Just uh, first. Ah, that's what it is. Yeah. That's. There we go. And if you want to just put us, yeah, that's right. Okay. Now, there are pictures of spiders here. So we're afraid of spiders. I'm sorry. They are only pictures. Everybody's born with a fear of spiders, but there's nothing to be afraid of now, okay? There are no harmful spiders in Northern Ireland, apart from one of these ones that I've got in my little container here, we'll show it later on, the black widow spider. So the first, the first slide, or the next slide coming up, shows a common orb spider, which you'll find out with, uh, in, a, in a web. Yeah, that's a, that's a nice big one. Uh, it's a heart-shaped one. You'll find them in orange, red, green, all different colors, out in your bushes in the garden itself. So. My talks about how we should appreciate insects and also how you see them in their natural environment in the garden and their biodiversity. Okay, so why are insects important? Well, first of all, they're not all pests. Only about three percent of insects are called pests, uh, and they become pests and start to, start to interfere with us or food. Uh, our fabrics, our buildings, that sort of thing. So they're not all pests. They're there for a reason, be it food for other animals or pollinators or decomposers. So they, they're not all pests. Let's get that clear. We need to uh, encourage pests or encourage insects as part of the whole ecosystem because they're a, a good food source for birds, bats, and small mammals. And as I said before, they're good pollinators. So if we were to disappear off the earth, Nothing would change. If insects disappeared, we'd be up, up, the, up the creek without a paddle. Okay, so we do need insects. We can't live without them for many, many reasons. Uh, trying to sustain or trying to create an insect garden doesn't come overnight. You need to work at it. You've got to produce the right foods, the right food plants for them to live on and to get established. And it's got to be available for future generations. So no point in bringing in one plant, something like a buddleia, which will attract butterflies and moths, certainly. But there's no food, no suitable plants for them to lay their eggs in. They're not going to hang around. So it's a, it's a one trip to visit the buddleia, have a feed and move on somewhere else. So if you're going to have a, a garden suitable for insects, it's got to have the right soil, and it's got to have the right plants and the right environment to sustain them. Now, why are they important? There's us up there. Uh, we are a mammal, one of four and a half thousand mammals in the world. Um, we think we're very important, but um, in the scheme of things, we're not really. Then there's birds, 8,600 species of birds. Okay. My mammals as they are, are furry creatures which produce milk for young, will produce live young as well. Uh, birds are feathered, so and they produce eggs most time, or yes, all times. Okay, so that's the difference between mammals and birds. But uh, we're the sort of bottom of the scale there. Four and a half thousand mammals compared to eight thousand six hundred uh, birds. Mites. These are little tiny, tiny things which inhabit our bodies. They're in our hair follicles. They're in our beds. They're in our skin. Um, we're surrounded by these mites. They're so small until they become plague numbers, you don't really notice them. They're like dust, like walking dust. Well, there's 300 species of those. Then you have spiders, 
50,000 spiders, 50,000 species of spiders in the world, mm -hmm. and we're still finding new ones. Uh, in, in Ireland, uh, we have the, the false black widow spider starting to inhabit here as well. Uh, it came in on, on exotic fruit or something like that, and it's now established itself in the south of Ireland, and it's up in the north of Ireland too. I'll show you one later on, a live one. And then we have insects, at least 4 million species of insects. Uh, that's a conservative estimation. We think there could be up to 5 million, maybe even 6 million. They haven't all been uh, discovered yet. They haven't all been named. In fact, we're losing two or three species every day because people are cutting down forests and uh, likes of South America, uh, India, and the insects are being destroyed before actually find, uh, can identify them, find them and identify them. So uh, we are one mammal versus four million insects. And the insects have been around for around three and a half million years before us. Sorry, uh, three and a half hundred million years before us. We've been around as walking beings for about half a million years. So they've been around a lot longer than us. So they, they, uh, they deserve to be on the earth more than we do probably. Oh, insects, said before, uh, insects form the, the diet of many birds, bats and small mammals. Uh, other invertebrates, earthworms and slugs and snails provide food for foxes, badgers, birds and small mammals during the winter time especially. You'll see foxes scraping up the, the ground uh, looking for worms underneath. So that's how they sustain themselves, eating earthworms at night time. Uh, it, their habitats dictate whether or not they and their predators can survive and establish. You've got to have the right conditions, the right plants for the insects to actually establish themselves. If they're not right, there'll be a population crash and they, they can't sustain the population. Okay. You see a lot of spiders are killed along the roads. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yes. Listen to me, hedgehog already. Well, hedgehog. Yeah, yeah. my son thought hedgehogs always came flat. <laughs> now I showed him a live hedgehog. So it's, but they're usually flat, so they're, well, that's another point. Um, the links between plants and insects uh, are long established, but they don't happen overnight. You've got wood, which is living wood. You've got living plants, which take a long time to establish. You've got dead wood, which is fallen wood or cut down wood. That begins to rot, and that provides a lot of food for insects as well. Then you've got their living leaves, which insects feed on, and then the roots. So plants do provide a food source for insects of all sorts. Cool. But to have those plants, you've got to have the right soil conditions, uh, the right pH, be it uh, acidity or alkalinity. You can't grow rhododendrons or azaleas in ordinary clay soil. It's got to be that uh, ericaceous soil, which is, I think, alkaline. I'm not, I'm not too good on plants, so I'm not. But they, do, they have to have the right um, soil to sustain the plant. So the plant's not going to survive, the insects won't survive either. Moisture content, well, we've had two or three good days of, of hot weather, hot, dry weather. I'm out hosing the garden down every two days. You probably need to do it every day in some places. Potted plants especially dry very, very quickly. They'll die and then the plants, uh, the insects die as well. But they're left in the sunshine. Insects don't like sunshine. A lot of them are, are nocturnal. So uh, if they're in sunshine all the time, they will avoid those plants. So uh, it's a that soil have to be right and remain right for successive populations of insects. Uh, and insects provide a vital role in plant reproduction, and that's by pollination, uh, and also they carry seeds away too. Some insects actually carry seeds, and that's how they spread plants from one place to another. And then they decompose uh, plants that have died. They uh, recycle the, the uh, organic material in the plant, and that goes into the ground, and then it's picked up by the roots again. Uh, they actually they also clear ground debris, and that allows new growth coming up. If you think of an earthworm, it will come out of its burrow at night time, grab a leaf and tuck it, uh, pull it down into the burrow where it rots down and then the, the uh, worm will eat it. Other things will eat that leaf as well. The worm doesn't eat it all to itself. You get other insects and bacteria and mites will feed that leaf as well. So they all have a symbiotic uh, relationship. They'll act together. Okay. If you don't have worms, your lawn will be covered in leaves uh, all winter long. So if you ever get a chance at night time, watch out for the worms coming out of their little holes and pulling the leaves in. 
and who you watch over the rats. Okay. Here, here's a typical life cycle of an insect. Um, there's a diagram there showing two adult flies have a good time and eggs are produced. Up to about 500 eggs at a time for house flies. The eggs hatch in the larvae, maggots. Uh, the maggots feed on the food substrate. It could be the likes of house flies, rotting vegetation. It could be animal excrement. Uh, they're not too fussy. They like cream buns as well. Uh, and once they're fully fed, they crawl away from the food substrate and go into a, co a cocoon or a pupal stage. And inside, inside there, magic happens. They go from a maggot into a fully grown adult. Then the whole cycle starts again. So it's a very simple life cycle. Egg, larvae, or nymphal stages. You get nymphs in aphids, uh, the pupal stage in adult. <clears throat> the eggs are laid on, have to be laid on a suitable food substrate, which has enough food to sustain the, the larvae through its whole development. If there is not enough food, the larvae will search for more food. and that time, it could be predated on by birds or other mammals. Um, it can also die. So once it's fully fed, the larvae looks for a suitable pupation site, usually in loose soil or sand. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, these stages can last from three weeks up to three years. And in one case, the cicada in America, the life cycle can last for 17 years. And the, the cicada reckons in 17 years, all its predators have died off or moved on somewhere else. So it's a very, very extreme life cycle. 17 years, it's the longest life cycle of any insect in the world. I'll show you some pictures of cicadas later on. The adult stage itself is usually the shortest, but the most important, as they, once they refuel themselves with a bit of nectar, they'll find a mate, but they don't always have to have a mate. Some produce eggs without mating, and then have to seek out a suitable food source to lay the, the eggs on. So the home in uh, on a plant, which they feed on, and then close by should be the food source for them to lay the eggs on, and then for the larvae to hatch out into and start to feed on. So the more variety you've got in the, the more variety you've got in the garden, the better. So that's sort of a black and white life cycle. The next picture shows a typical moth species. This is a magpie moth, which um, I first started collecting when I was five or six years of age. Fortunately, the most of them escaped much middle is hard. But uh, these will feed on hawthorn, sloes, elms, apple, and even privet. That's where I used to collect mine on privet. There's a typical egg batch on a leaf that's laid on the underside of the leaf. They'd be laid within about an hour of the female starting to lay the eggs. And they all hatch out at the same time into these caterpillars. Um, they're quite a striking creature, so they are the, the magpie moth caterpillar. And all caterpillars start to feed on the edge of the leaf. They'll feed on the edge and work their way in towards the, the veins. So that's the difference between slugs and caterpillars feeding. Slugs will bore a hole in the middle of the leaf, whereas caterpillars start the edge and work their way in. So the caterpillar will feed away on the, on the leaf there. Once it's fully fed, uh, it, it drops down into the soil. There's some, uh, that's okay. Uh, once it's fully fed, uh, it will either drop down in the soil, or in the case of the magpie moth, it spins up this lovely pupil case here. I'm trying to get the arrow on. There's it there. And that's yellow and black, yellow and black stripes. This is a, a running theme, third insects. Yellow and black is a, a, a danger warning sign to birds and small mammals. Uh, if you think of wasps and bees, they've got black and white stripes as well. So birds don't want to get stung. So if they see some of the black and white stripes, they're very cautious. They won't eat it immediately. Uh, they'll think about it and then they decide not to go for it. But inside that cocoon there, magic happens. It goes from the, the caterpillar, which is a feeding tube, really. They get, it eats here, goes all through the body, and then it pulls out the other end there. So from a feeding tube in this pupil stage here, uh, and it becomes this beautiful adult from, from inside the cocoon itself. And the adult's got its antennae, six pairs of legs, the wings, reproductive system, digestive system, uh, all the means for reproduction and flying away. So a lot of magic happens inside, happens inside the cocoon itself. 
So what sort of plants do we need to sustain insect variety? We need trees, bushes and ground plants. Some typical trees are the willow. They produce flowers very early on the year and that uh, provides food for emerging insects like uh, solitary bees, uh, hibernating uh, uh, butterflies like um, uh, peacock moths and red admirals. And they'll, they'll feed on the willow flowers early on to refuel themselves really. Uh, you also need the poplars, hazels, sorry, hazel, cherry, oak, and lime. Now a dead fallen tree is still a long-term uh, source of food and shelter. Uh, there is a law which may, uh, out in the countryside, if a tree falls down, you're not supposed to chop it up and remove it because it's full of insect life still. There's insects inside there feeding on the wood and if you destroy that, you'll lose those species. So an act was passed about 20 years ago to uh, stop people from cutting down big trees like the oak tree. An oak tree can sustain some like 500 different species of insects in its lifetime while it's alive and even more when it's dead. So trees are very, very good source of food for insects. Then you have their bushes, you've got hawthorns, both the berries and leaves are a good food source. Beech bushes, uh, think of um, uh, gold, golden beech, golden beech, yeah, copper, copper beech, spindle or plum, buddleias, roses, privets, cotoneaster. Both the berries and the leaves are good sustainable food for insects. Ground plants, things like primroses, dandelions especially, they come out quite early in the year too, and their bright yellow flowers uh, attract solitary bees honeybees, hoverflies, they will feed on the nectar and uh, then they'll go off their eggs and the civil food subject close by. Docks are great for dock beetles. Nettles, quite a vital uh, ingredient in the life cycle of peacocks and red admirals. Uh, I keep a pot of nettles and dandelions just to attract different insects in. Cow parsley, buttercups, thistles, clovers, both white and blue, uh, white and reds, the grasses, cereals, wildflower varieties of all sorts. So I think you've all begun, begun packets of wildflower seeds. So the more variety there is, the more you're going to attract insects into your, your garden. All right. Mm -hmm. Yep, fine. Thank you. Uh, typical food chain here. Uh, grand, yeah. This mm -hmm. is in the form of a pyramid. You've got grasses and seeds and fruit and wood and animal products at the bottom there. Now, animal products are things like excrement, cow pats, um, dead bodies as well. Insects will utilize those, they'll break them down into nutrients, which are then leached into the soil and help plants as well. So nothing's wasted in the natural world. If you think you've ever seen some of these safari things where you see an elephant, I saw a video of an elephant that had been shot by poachers and left in the wild, and it was down to the bare bones within two weeks. That's how fast, you know. You get these different flies coming in and eating all the flesh, and also, you know, life, 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 life is a cycle, so it is. You know, you come and you go, and hopefully you do some good in your passing. The grasses, both the the uh, stalks and the, the stems and the roots, are good uh, food sources for insects. Seeds, of course, things born in the seeds and eat the the nice juicy contents within the seed. Fruit, of course, is good for um, high energy. Um, carbohydrates, and then wood, as I said, fallen wood and living wood, both are shelter and food for insect species. But further up the food chain are the insects, spiders which live on insects, earthworms of all sorts, and crustaceans. Crustaceans are things like um, uh, wood lice. They break down wood quite easily. Once the wood starts to get a bit damp and starts to rot, the wood lice tunnel into it and break it down even further. So these are the sort of mid-chamber of the, the food chain, and these provide food for ones at the top there, the birds, the bats, and small mammals. And the small mammals would be things like uh, voles, mice, shrews. So we are in fact uh, related to shrews. Our great, 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 great ancestors were insectivores. So after the, uh, the big uh, meteorite hit, um, only insectivores survived, all the dinosaurs and things were wiped out, and they became mammals, and we then 
came from them eventually. So that's the sort of a typical food chain. Uh, you've got lots and lots of grasses and plant material and animal products at the bottom. Then you've got smaller numbers of insects and spiders and things, and then a smaller number of birds at the top. So that's a typical pyramid food chain. <clears throat> I've mentioned about nettles. Here's a cluster of uh, uh, caterpillars. I think these are red abnormal caterpillars feeding on nettle. So at the top there, you can see where they've actually defoliated the skeleton mice the plant there already. They stay in a cluster like this here for safety. If a bird comes along <clears throat> to feed on them, the vibration makes them all drop down below the leaf itself. So they'll, they'll distribute them, they'll disperse for safety below there. So maybe one or two uh, caterpillars get eaten by the bird, but all the rest are safe. Uh, and this formless cluster is like a herd immunity. So there's, they all stick together there until they're attacked and then they all drop down. And nettles are sting things. So birds like, don't like to go into too much. So I say I keep a pot of nettles and a pot of dock uh, dandelions to track insects in. The bane, the bane of most uh, gardeners, cabbage white butterfly. These, these are fully fed now and they're on their way down into the ground to pupate. They'll form their pupil case in loose soil below the plant. They'll feed on any kind of uh, brassica at all. Um, they'll go for cauliflower, cabbage, okay. um, Brussels sprouts, all that sort of thing. So uh, birds will pick these things off if you allow them to. There's also a parasitic wasp which lays its egg inside the body of the caterpillar and it hatches into about, it splits into about 30 different eggs and they'll eat the inside of the caterpillar and then burst out as adult moths or adult wasps. Quite horrific, but it's uh, one way of biological control. Now from the sublime small uh, caterpillars to something a bit more meaty, the elephant hawk moth. This feeds on poplar and willow herb. As you can see on the pictures up with the hands, they're the size of your forefinger, and they're that sort of size. It's the biggest caterpillar we get in the UK. Whereas the moth down below there isn't all that big. It's not the biggest moth, but a very pretty one, uh, buff brown and uh, purple wings to it. Um, defense mechanism on the elven hog moth are these big eye spots here at the front of the head. If it's been attacked by a bird or a, a mouse or something, it actually pumps air into its head and blows the eyes up to make it look really scary. And it does deter predators. They'll back off and that gives the caterpillar time to scurry off into a bit of shelter somewhere. They've also got a, um, a spike on the end of its tail. This one here looks like it's been broken off for some reason, but it does have quite a long spike on the tail. And they can actually flick the spike into the face of the predator too, which is a bit of a shock for a bird or a mouse. They don't expect something to attack it. But that is a powerful lot of protein for a bird. That would do a whole nest of baby sparrows, so it would. But these are quite common. I live near a park here, and in autumn time, you'll see these walking along the path, looking for a suitable source, a suitable uh, bit of soil to bury, bury themselves in. So they are fairly common. I've, I've had dozens of these in the past. But if there's, a, if there's a stand of poplars or willows or willow herb about the place, have a look around there in the autumn time. You might get a very pleasant surprise. The adults are on the wing from uh, early spring onwards, so you get those out and about now. And they're looking for, again, a suitable, uh, to lay their eggs on the poplar, they'll hatch out and form this. It's a very small caterpillar to start with, but it gets to this size by on time. Bottom time. And there's only one generation of these in the year. So they're very slow, slow breeding in insect, unfortunately. There's your willow herb there. Very no, common in the field. No, it's it's and you know, you know what poplar looks like. Yeah. Another, one, another one of the hawk moths. There's a humming bee hawk moth. This doesn't have any defensive mechanism apart from the spine at the end there. That's quite a, a harsh. A uh, very hard spine, so it'll use that to flick its into the, the face of a, a predator as well. So that's their defense mechanism, the spine. And that's fitting on bed straw there. That's wonderful, isn't that? Really wonderful. But the, the actual hot moth itself, uh, it's called a hummingbird hot moth because it does sound and look like a hummingbird 
hawk, a hummingbird, hummingbird in fact, and his wing beats are something like 50 to the minute. So it has to sustain itself. The big long tongue on will go into convolvus, into tube-like flowers, suck out nectar, and nectar is very high carb carbohydrate, very high in carbohydrates, and needs that to sustain its muscles. Uh, I've only ever seen two of these in 50 years, one down in Drum where I was doing a study, and six of these came into the garden feeding on bubblia and um, lavender. And I was with two or three other experts. They all got the cameras out and photographing these things. It was a very rare event. They don't survive here over the winter time. They fly in, they get blown in by the wind, possibly from Wales or from England, and they will live here for a year, but they don't establish themselves because the conditions aren't right during the winter time. So they come in year after year after year. They're not established here yet, but come uh, climate change, things could happen. We're getting things coming across from a continent and from England all the time to establish here. At the moment, our conditions are just too mild for them to go into a hibernation state. So that also will feed on thistle, buddleia, red valerian, say lavender, convolvus as well. A very rare creature to see. Now these are uh, sort of creatures that birds don't like. Um, back to the old yellow and black striping again. Yes, you can see in this cap there here, very, very distinct yellow black stripes. And uh, it's feeding on ragwort. This is a cinnabar moth caterpillar. And ragwort is full of alkaloids, which poisons to horses and ponies. It will actually kill them if they eat too much of it. But the caterpillar can eat the leaves of the ragwort, does no harm at all. But they build up the uh, alkaloids in their body. So a bird comes along and squeezes it, it gets this alkaloid poison in its mouth and burns its mouth. And birds remember nasty occurrences. So when you do it once, they'll never do it again. So that's their defense mechanism. If they get eaten or squashed uh, by a bird, the bird only does it once, and that's the rest of the population saved. But you'll see clusters of these out in ragwort. Ragwort is a, um, a weed, it's a noxious weed, and by law, it's supposed to be disposed of properly. By farmers, but I see fields of these all the time. Farmers don't just don't bother. It's not worth you know, it's, it's not worth the expense of getting rid of ragwort. So it's good for the, the cinnabar moth. Um, but they're the only ones who make anything out of it. Birds and other mammals do not get to eat them. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's one way of stopping things eating you. The other way is to be very, very hairy, extremely hairy. Uh, for one thing, the birds can't get a good grip of the caterpillar. And the hair is sticking in their mouths as well. That's not a nice taste. So this is the, the garden tiger moth. It's a general feeder. It's also called the hairy Mary or the woolly bear. On a nice bright sunny days, you'll see these wandering across the roads quite often. And I don't know how many times I've stopped the car to let one of these things cross the road. I'm a bit crazy, a bit eccentric, so I'll, I'll pick them up and put them on the side of the road to save them. So they look extremely hairy. They don't look like don't look like caterpillar at all. So birds ignore them. And then they think it is a caterpillar. They can't actually grab the body of the thing because the hairs are so thick. And the hair is also sticking in their mouths. So that's one of the mechanisms. And you also be something like this, really exotic. This one lives in Northern Ireland quite rarely. I've only seen two or three of these as well in 50 odd years. But they look like a made up caterpillar. The colours are fantastic. It looks like a toothbrush, an exotic toothbrush. It's got these red stripes with the uh, red spots at the back here, red stripey hairs here, and then these tufts here as well. But again, very hairy uh, and well disguised. Birds may not recognize that as a caterpillar at all. So extremely pretty to look at, but too hairy for them to, to eat. Other ones that uh, disguise themselves as branches or twigs, the peppered, uh, peppered moth. Uh, you can see there, that looks like a bit of a twig there. Uh, and there's the knots, there's the sort of feeding it does on, on leaves. So it disguises itself as a twig. Uh, when it's moving, uh, it forms this looper. It's a looping sort of movement. And you can see it's quite, it's got all these little segments with spots and things on, and it just looks like a twig. So that's our nearest uh, equivalent to a stick insect, which you get in things places like Asia, uh, where they disguise themselves as sticks or, or leaves, and that's our equivalent of it. Unfortunately, we have changed the uh, evolution of the peppered hawk moth adult. The adults um, 
rest on trees. And during the Industrial Revolution, the trees turned black and brown. So what happened was uh, all, the, all the moths that were white colored or pale colored were eaten by birds. The ones who were dark were disguised behind, uh, against the, the bark and they survived. So only the black ones were able to survive. They mated with other black ones or other dark ones and then produced more and more dark ones. So that's the, the natural selection or survival of the fittest. So all the white ones disappeared. But of course now, clean environment, the trees would turn back to being pale again. So all the dark ones are being targeted by birds and eaten by birds. So only the pale ones survive. So they made them paler and produce more pale ones. So I've actually changed in the space of 100 years, the colors of uh, peppered moths from dark to light, to light to dark again. So, you know, we've had this, we've had this uh, influence on a generation, mm -hmm. evolution of one moth species alone. Some other common uh, caterpillars you'll find in your garden. The top one's a tomato moth, also called a brown, brown line bright eye. A lovely yellow stripe along the side there. Uh, that will strip your tomatoes very, very quickly. It only takes two caterpillars to strip a tomato plant down to nothing. Uh, winter moths, they will feed on your apple leaves, as will tortrix moths. They will make these massive holes in your leaves, which is detrimental to the, the health of the, the apple tree itself and pear trees. Small ermine moths, they will strip down hawthorn very, very quickly. And again, they form this big clump. So a bird comes to eat one, they all drop down in little silken webs. Uh, down to the ground, and then the birds can't find them anymore. And then they climb up and start to feed again. But I've seen com whole hedges completely defoliated by the hawthorn. Up the airport road towards uh, Aldergrove, up there, the hawthorn gets stripped almost every other year. But the hawthorn comes back every year, so it doesn't do too much harm to it. Then there's no, another one of those hawk moths, a poplar hawk moth, as the name suggests, it feeds on poplars. Lovely green coloration. I, I visited the Copeland Islands a couple of years ago and I was looking through all the foliage and came across a small hazel tree. And one female had flown in from the mainland, laid about 50 eggs, the eggs all hatched out and produced all these caterpillars. Now they will stay on there unless they're blown off as an adult again. But that's how things move from one place to another. The, the female moth was fully fertile. She was blown from Donegal possibly, onto the Copeland Islands uh, and then start off the whole population there. So there's plenty of food for them there and I'll get back hopefully this year and hopefully they'll be sustainable, the, the colony will be still sustained. They're quite a rare creature to the wolf-tailed moth, but uh, it's nice to see them on a secluded island like that. Some of the pretty butterflies I find too, the peacock and red admiral, these two would hibernate over the winter time uh, in dark, dark, cool places like garages or sheds. There's mention later on about butterfly hotels as well. Uh, the peacock moth, so called because of the, the eyes on its tail and the four, four ones. Uh, the red admiral, uh, it's a lovely creature as well. That's on Buddleia there. I think it's on Buddleia as well. That's lilac, possibly. Um, they will lay their eggs on the underside of leaves as well. This is the, the cabbage white butterfly, as I mentioned before. Uh, I've I spotted five or six of these in the garden already, and they are coming out, mating, and then laying their eggs in batches of 50 to 100 at a time. That's on the underside of the cabbage there, and they'll hatch out into the adult, into the caterpillars, and that's the sort of damage they do to completely still nice. So a lot of people put up a mesh or netting over their cabbages or the brassicas to stop these from laying their eggs. That's a good idea, so it is. But it only takes one small hole because they can smell the brassicas growing and they'll try their dam to stick it in the abbey hole to lay their eggs. That's what they're there for. They've got to, to produce the next generation. So they're very, very keen that they get in and lay their eggs. Onto the smaller sort of things that again are a big problem in the garden. Uh, aphids, uh, these are the rose aphids. They're, they're quite small things, but they come in big numbers. Uh, and this is on the rose itself. 
they only, not only do they suck out the sap, they pierce into the, the stem of the plant, suck out the sap, which again does away with a lot of good for the plant, but they will also transfer viruses in their mouth parts. So they spit out some of the last plant material they fed, and that transfers the virus to the next plant food. So they're not only detrimental to the plant by sucking out its juices, they can transmit viruses as well. So although they're extremely small, they do make it up in numbers. Uh, but this is who gets the benefit of it. Uh, tits, finches, um, warblers, all sorts of things feed on the aphids early on in the year. They pick up hundreds of them at a time. Most of them are right and then take them back to their babies in the nest. And that's a good food source. You can see in this picture down the bottom here, that is a stem completely covered in aphids. You know, there's, there's thousands of aphids per uh, couple of inches. So that's good food. And they don't move very far either. So that if the bird comes down, it can fill three big with lots of aphids and then come back and feed that onto the, the babies. Something a bit different. Uh, soft fly caterpillars, these look a bit similar to moth larvae, moth caterpillars, but uh, they have this sort of S shape normally and they will, they will notch out leaves too. There's a gooseberry soft fly which is quite prevalent, especially in my garden. Every year it wipes out my gooseberry plants and never get gooseberries at all. But I like the gooseberry soft fly, so I just I only just grow it for the soft flies. But whenever they're fully grown, they turn into this wasp like creature. It's a soft fly. And it's called a soft fly because this egg laying tube is actually shaped of a saw. It saws into the stem of the plant there and pushes the egg deep down. The egg hatches out into the larvae here. The larvae can feed along the edges of the plant and will skeletonize the plant completely down to the veins, down the ribs of the plant. Uh, I'll go and talk about some of the beetles as well. We'll come across this big beastie here. Is, it's called a cockchafer beetle, but also mayor June bug because, as the name suggests, they come out, the adults come out uh, as these big brown beasties, May and June time. They'll fly quite readily around the place. They're harmless apart from they feed on the fruits, on the blossoms of fruit trees, apples, pears. They're not fussy what they feed on, but they do nibble the, the uh, blossoms. They don't do an awful lot of harm. By that stage, the fruits should have set anyway. Uh, but underground, they live as this massive big grub here, and they will feed on the roots of cereals and grasses for two to three years. They're a big thing about an inch uh, to two inches in length. Uh, all the feeding here, the massive big. Uh, mouth parts up to this end, three pairs of walking legs. And you see here the sparkles, that's how insects breathe. They don't have lungs as such. They actually absorb moisture through these wee holes in their sides, go straight to their uh, lymph and their, their blood system. But these are great, great food source for rooks and crows and things like that. You'll see them digging up ground. They can hear these things eating under, underground. And they'll dig down two or three inches deep to try to catch these brutes here because it's a good food source it is for them. And birds will eat the adults on the wing too if they're flying around the place. I come across thrushes eating these things. Uh, thrushes go for snails normally, but th these are good food for, for adults as well. And slightly smaller is the, the garden chafer. There's also the rose chafer, and these will make quite a big mess of your roses. The adults will nibble the leaves of your rose bushes and the grubs will go for the roots of the roses underground. So these are sort of things you can come across in the garden, in, in the garden quite easily. This is the, the biggest beetle we get in uh, the UK. Unfortunately, or fortunately, it doesn't exist in Ireland. It needs, uh, as I mentioned before, you need to have, make sure you have enough food to sustain these things. And they live only in well-established oak uh, forests. Ireland doesn't have enough oak forests anymore. We never did have the stag beetle here, but think it uh, started moving in England about 10, 12,000 years ago, just after the last ice age, and it never got across to Ireland, unfortunately. But it's, a very, it's the biggest beast we get. It's about three inches from the tip of that stag horn there to its backside there. They can fly quite happily. They will fly to the top of an oak tree or climb to the top. The two males will have fight with their stags, their horns, and whoever loses falls down the base of the tree and the male has a chance to mate with the females that are about to place. And by the time the other male gets up to the top, he's exhausted. He's, not, he's lost interest in sex by that stage. 
Um, but they're a beautiful creature. Again, there's the grub there. Uh, it eats and it feeds on the decaying wood of trees. It'll eat fresh wood as well. And that's what woodpeckers are after normally. This is a massive big grub. Again, a great food source for woodpeckers and their young. Uh, woodpeckers have this bad reputation for feeding on small birds as well. But most times they're looking for these massive big grubs here because more of these big grubs than there is uh, small birds to feed on. So they've never been here, but they, they do live in England. There's actually a stag beetle today where people go out and try to count these things. And once the grub is fully fed, it can take three to four years feeding inside a, an oak tree. They form out this hollow, and inside this is a pupil, uh, a pupae in here. And you see the, the stag horns start to form already, and its legs up here. There's the two eyes up on top there, and the antennae start to form too. It's quite alien looking, so it is, but uh, it's amazing what creatures are beneath, just beneath the wood or beneath the soil. Um, we have dung everywhere. So we have dung beetles, and they love nothing better than a good fresh cow pat. Uh, they'll fly around quite readily and home in on the smell of a fresh cow pat. Everybody's got their own favorite food, I suppose, and dung beetles have a particular attraction. So they go along the dung pat, they lay their eggs in it, and out uh, inside the dung pat form these massive big grubs as well. So if you come across a cow pat in your garden or a field nearby, get a, get a pair of gloves on you, have we hook through, and you never know what you come across. Make sure you wear gloves because uh, cow pats and horse manure have nasties in them as well. But those are massive big grubs. And uh, this is, shows you the larvae, the pupil stage here, and the adult. But these things fly quite red, readily at night time. There's a golf range near me, and these things are attracted to lights at night time. So you have your windows open, they will fly in through your windows and be stuck on the windowsill for some time. They get caught on curtains because they've got these really hairy, spiny legs, and they get stuck in the curtains as well. Completely harmless to us. They're very good, they're very beneficial in that they break down manure. If it wasn't for the lack of horse uh, flies or dung beetles, we'd be knee deep in cow manure very, very quickly. So again, that's a really good food source. You'll see rooks and other crows getting their heads stuck in the manure heaps into uh, cow pats. And they're not just doing it for the fun of it, they're searching for these grubs. So um, that's the dung beetle for you. Inside wood itself, you'll find all sorts of uh, beetles inside there. It's the infamous wood uh, woodworm. It'll feed on fresh wood and rotted wood as well. If you get some firewood from outside and bring it indoors, make sure you burn it. Don't leave it as a decorative piece because if there's woodworm in there, they will emerge from the wood and then go into your furniture or your wooden floors. So I, I've been to some famous castles where they have these lovely fireplaces set with big logs and all, and they wonder where the woodworm's coming from or the death watch beetle's coming from, and it's from the wood they're brought from and from the forests. So you'd never know what you're bringing in uh, on wood from outside. That's a death watch beetle there. Wood boring weevils, big long snout on them. Uh, a longhorn beetle that loves uh, fresh wood, especially oak. Uh, they're quite a big grub. There's the grub of it there, in fact. And they will pass on fungus from one plant or from one tree to another too. So those are some of the beetles that live inside wood, uh, fallen, fallen trees. Then weevils. Uh, weevils, another band of gardeners, especially this one here, the vine weevil, quite a distinctive thing, a long, a long snout to it, uh, speckled back. Uh, they can't fly, which is a good thing, but they can climb up smooth surfaces. So whenever they get, if they go to a flower pot like a cyclamen or a strawberry or a primrose, she will lay, lay about 50 eggs at a time. The eggs hatch out into these wee grubs here, a brown head with a white body, no legs. They don't need to go anywhere. They're inside a pot and they will actually decimate all the roots in that pot. So the plant's doing very well until you see it start to wilt a wee bit and you go to pick up a leaf and the whole plant comes out in your hand. The roots have been completely cut off at ground level, soil level. And these things will feed over the winter time in your glass houses quite readily. So uh, there's not much you can do about them rather than put in insecticides which I try to avoid. 
you can get uh, nematodes, which you can put in, and that these little nematode worms go into the larvae of the vine weevil and kill it. But the temperature has to be just right. It's got to be above 14 degrees centigrade and below 30 degrees centigrade, otherwise the uh, nematodes die off. They're also very susceptible to sunshine. If you try to apply them in sunlight, the nematodes are killed almost instantly by sunlight. The UV light kills them very quickly. So they're, they're quite nasty creatures. The vine weevils will climb up into your plants and if it's a potted plant, they'll lay a lot of eggs in and they'll just decimate your roots. So that's the vine weevil. Uh, there's another one, the clay colored weevil, same sort of size, different coloration, uh, but does the same thing. And there's a sort of typical damage of weevil damage, notched leaves, very, very typical damage. But it's not until the plant's almost dead and deca uh, decapitated, you discover the, the weevil grubs already, already all, all there. It's a hidden surprise, which you don't want to find. Uh, lily beetle, this is where I arrived in Northern Ireland in the last 10 years or so. A very distinctive adult, a cardinal red colour, very shiny body to it. These fly quite readily. They only go for lilies, lily plants, and they'll strip the lily plant bare as well. They'll just scalp nice and from the top. The larvae, uh, that's what the larvae look like there. Head, three, uh, three pairs of walking legs, but that's not what they look like on the plant. They actually use their own excrement to disguise themselves, so birds don't feed on them. So they're very, very smart wee creature. That is, there's a larvae inside that, and that is his own doodos it's covered itself with. So very good form of camouflage. But these will start at one end of the street and move up the street within a year and spread the whole population and start to attack your plants. Again, insecticides are the only thing to use against them. I'm not a great advocate of insecticide, but sometimes it's the only thing you can do. But always try to use a safe insecticide, which breaks down fairly quickly. A contact insecticide kills them and then gets washed away by the, the rain, which isn't very effective, but you have to redo it again. Well, out to control, there's something called the Adderall's Coach Horse Beetle. Um, it's quite a beneficial thing. It eats slugs, slug eggs, snails, maggots, anything get hold of. And that's his mandibles, that's his, his front uh, mouth parts. Very, very useful. It mangles anything it finds. It can fly. There's wings on, on, under that wee uh, pouch there. And people think they're scorpions at first because they will lift their tail up like a scorpion to scare off predators again. This is a fencing mechanism. They flick their tail up and enough to scare off a bird or a small mammal and give it time to run away. Uh, it will nip you, it'll nip youngsters even worse. They don't have any poisons in their mandibles, but they will give you a nasty wee nip. And if they've been feeding on something nasty, like a, a dead slug, that could be infectious. So you can get an infection from their, their nips. So just be very careful. But these hide under uh, stones and logs uh, very commonly. You'll see them feeding on batches of slug eggs quite often. I'm actually surprised to find they're about an inch in length, black, um, quite, quite a big basin. They move very, very fast. Somebody was mentioned about daddy long legs. Um, there's what the daddy long legs looks like there as an adult. I think we've all seen before. Uh, the legs detach themselves very, very easily, uh, unfortunately. So a bird tries to catch it by the, the leg, the leg comes off and the die long legs can fly on. There's two types in Northern Ireland which cause cereal growers a big problem. They lay their eggs in the soil just as the seed is being uh, planted and they hatch out into the grubs, which is the leather jacket. That's the feeding end here and that's the, the, the poo end of that end there. And they'll feed on grasses, the roots of grasses and cereals, barley, wheat, uh, oats, doesn't matter what the cereal is, they will nip off the, the roots of the living plant and destroy it. And you get these patches of bare, bare earth in the crops. But they're also food for all these things here, rooks, starlings, foxes, badgers. So they will dig up the ground looking for these things. So if you come across patches in your, your lawn, uh, it means there's other insects or um, beetles or something under the ground and the birds or animals can hear them. They can sense they're there and they do try to dig them up. 
So the, the dyed long legs come out in spring uh, and autumn time, mate, and then reduce the eggs for the, the following winter. And they, they, the, the larvae, the leather jackets, only survive during the winter time. So they're a good source of food for, for, for birds. And there's a wee pied wagtail. It's caught the, the daddy long legs by the wing, which doesn't detach, and it can chomp away on that quite happily. So it's got a nice wee snack. Uh, some insects come out on a very regular basis. This is the, it's the favorite fly, also called St. Mark's fly. Comes out in St. Mark's, around St. Mark's Day, about I think it's the 23rd of April. Uh, these come out in their plagues, and people think they're really nasty insects because it's got these big long dangly legs, and people think they're stingers. And they're quite obnoxious looking too, they look quite sinister, so they do, but the adults are completely harmless. They're great pollinators for fruit trees, so they are. As they come out in uh, April time, sometimes late as May, with lots of fruit trees around the place, they will go in to get the pollen and nectar and pollinate the trees quite happily. And their grubs look a bit like small, hairy uh, leather jackets. They're found in massive bundles under the ground too, but they're feeding on, on dead grass and dead cereal roots. Now stuff has been, gone with, uh, been killed by fungus. So they're actually doing a good job of decomposing rotted uh, plant material into nutrients to go back in the soil again. So all in all, the St. Mark's fly are a real beneficial insect and a food source for insects as well. Bats will take these at night time and birds have a field day. You'll see the rooks picking these grubs up as well in the soil. Again, there's a, there's a reason for everything. There's a, a source of food for other creatures. Some of the aquatic species will come across. If you've got a pond uh, in your gardens or a slow moving stream even, you get uh, things like caddis fly. This is a caddis fly adult. Uh, again, the adult itself is a good food, food source for dippers, uh, for fish as well. So they fly quite readily around this time of year. The larvae can disguise themselves with various things. This one's surround, it gets a silken uh, cocoon around itself and then gets all the little stones. It's like paving stones almost all stuck together. And that's how it disguises itself in this tube of uh, small pebbles. And this one here has got bits of vegetative material. And again, that's well camouflaged. It just gets the silken webbings from its mouth and gums it all together. I've actually seen them using uh, snail shells as a, 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 a camouflage as well. And uh, as birds, uh, fish, uh, frogs, will all go for these sort of things. Mayflies, uh, the adults, only live for one or two days during the summertime. Um, they lay their eggs into the water and they, they hatch into the larval state here. But the larva, the adult bodies, once they die, again, fish will eat them. They'll eat them on the wing as well. They'll, you'll see trout jumping to catch the mayflies on the wing. Um, but they're very short lived. The larvae are feeder feeders and they're extremely good water quality indicators. If the water's been polluted by slurry or something like that, it'll wipe out the larvae, and that's an indicator of a problem in your water. The mayflies are beautiful winged things too. They're really quite spectacular. Uh, say great source of food for birds, fish, and bats as well late on in the evening. The infamous Loch Ness fly looks very like uh, a biting midge or mosquito even, but they're completely harmless. Again, they're pollinators of trees, especially hawthorn around Loch Ney. They're great food sources. You'll see the swallows and, and uh, house martens that come up to the Loch Ney Discovery Centre. They come from Africa just to feed in these things. There are thousands, millions of, of the flies around Loch Ney itself. You'll see clouds of them hovering above trees, all trying to mate with each other. And they're larvae called a bloodworm. Uh, completely, they're not, they don't feed nuts or anything, but their coloration, they're, there's stuff called hemoglobin in their body, and uh, they're a great source of food for fish. So there's always a reason for something, so there is. There's a kingfish on the caddisfly larvae for a wee snack. 
kingfishers don't just eat fish, they'll go for any aquatic larvae or any aquatic life under the water. Dragonflies, one of my most favorite insects. I, uh, I will try to catch them. If you hold your hand out long enough, they will land on you. Um, they've been around for the, those fossils there found in Germany. They're around 250 million years old. And the wingspan of those ancient uh, uh, dragonflies was 30 inches, two and a half feet wide. Uh, today, you're lucky to get them up to six inches in wingspan. So both the adults and the larvae are predators of other insects above water and below water. Uh, adults will take flying insects on the wing and their larvae will take uh, insects, small tadpoles, fish even, underwater. That's the, the immature stage of the dragonfly there. You can just make out its wing buds there before they're formed. Um, they will attack tadpoles and fishes, say, but other aquatic insects as well. I've been bitten by these things a few times. When they're fully fed, they leave the water, they climb up a boulder rush or a reed, uh, anchor themselves onto it, and then split their back, and now comes the adult. The adult then climbs up, spreads its wings out, and then flies away in the sunshine. They are beautiful creatures, so they are. The smaller version, a bit more dainty, is the, the damselfly. Again, their fierce predators as larvae. There's a larvae there. Quite a dainty thing, but it'll go for other insect larvae. They wouldn't go for a, a tadpole or a, a fish, it's too small. But you get the damselflies in different colors. You get bottle green, reds, and blues. Pond skater. Uh, these are, these are pre, uh, predate in other insect larvae as well under, underwater. They can actually walk on water. They've got very, very fine, hairy legs. And the water tension, the surface tension of water is not broken. So simply walk across the water and try to spot an insect which is struggling to leave the water and they'll uh, jump on it and kill it. So. Water boatman, another predator. Uh, this can turn itself upside down, swim uh, belly up as it were, to see things coming from the surface as well. So its legs are actually uh, converted into like paddle shapes, so they can swim very, very fast so they can. But these are actually, they're not a beetle, they're a hemipteran or a bug, but they will grab onto its prey with its front legs and then pierce it with its mouth parts and then suck the thing dry. Another great predator is the, the great diving beetle. There's the larvae there and you can see, you can see its mouth parts. Uh, the mouth parts are extremely uh, uh, sharp and then grabs all the mouth parts and then uh, holds with his legs and chomps it. They, these are for catching a the prey, these sharp mandibles, but they're actually fitting, man, fitting mouth parts in the head as well. They'll actually chomp a bit, think of bits. So that'll go for, again, tadpoles, fish, another insect larvae. There's the adults there. And both the adults, uh, the adults can fly. If the pond starts to dry out, uh, the beetle can fly to another pond to start up again. So they're not confined to one pond. Sorry, my wife's holding a conversation with my daughter. Um, so these are one of, the, one of the fiercest predators. If they're in your, in your pond, they will wipe out everything else, unfortunately, including tadpoles. But if a duck or two ducks land in your pond, they'll eat this as well. I've been to several ponds where everything's disappeared and then we told have been three or four uh, mallard duck come in and they just clean the whole thing, unfortunately. And you've got herons about the place, they'll take everything too. So nothing's safe in your pond. We may talk about ponds later on, the benefits of them, very therapeutic. Leeches, despite all the rumors, the common leech we get here is the horse leech and it will not bite us, it will not suck your blood. It has with a medicinal leech, which has proper mouth parts for piercing our skin. But you find in ponds quite a lot, they'll go for fish, tadpoles, even slugs. You can see in this one here, there's the mouth parts right down to the very front of the slug there. And this is, it, it injects an enzyme 
which dissolves the inside of the slug and just slurps it up. I, I think they're fantastic creatures. They swim better than dolphins when you get them in a, a, a water tank. They're gorgeous things to have. Uh, they don't last too long outside of the water. They do need a, an, an aquatic environment to live in. That's why I say get ponds in your gardens. Other attackers, people love ladybirds because they're so nice and cuddly. Uh, but unfortunately, all they do is eat green fly and caterpillars as well, both the adults and the larvae. They will eat 50 to 100 green fly a day. There's the, the larvae there ripping apart a, a green fly. And that's one, that's the adult taking out a green fly from the back. It eats from the base up and eventually there's just a the head left and the wee antennae are still twitching around the place and the green fly nose is in trouble by that stage. But they're great predators. I would try to gather these up during the summertime and bring them in my own garden. I don't use insecticides, I'd rather use natural uh, biological control. This one's a seven spot. You see one, two, three, and that one there is seven spot. Uh, you can get them up to 22 spots, 30 spots. Get them in yellow and black, uh, red and black, all black or all red. There's some like, 20, I think it's about 30 different variations of them. And they're all predatory on aphids and uh, moth eggs as well. But the, the larvae are very fierce predators too. And they're very, very mobile. And they look nothing at all like the, the adult. Unfortunately, um, the Americans have a thing called the Harlequin ladybird, which is at least one and a half to two times bigger than our ladybirds. And these were brought in to Europe to help wipe out uh, pest species in Europe in the orchards. Unfortunately, they do a very, very good job. They eat everything, including beneficial insects, including ladybirds. So unfortunately, they've now arrived in Northern Ireland, thanks to a tradition of us bringing uh, a very famous market into Belfast, and they're not checked for passports or anything else. And these creatures hibernate in sheds and trailers, and they come across here, drop off, and they're now established in the center, very center of Belfast, in a very famous building called City Hall. I didn't say that. They're around the Rose Garden there, but they've literally just dropped off these trailers from the continental market, and they're now established. We have found them in the countryside as well. But uh, we're keeping a close eye and see how far they go. But again, if they get in here and get established, there's no predators for them. Uh, birds don't eat them, so they don't, because they emit a poison through their elbows, uh, which birds don't like and spit them out again. So if they get established here, we're in serious trouble. Other things like green fly, uh, hoverflies, we're back to the old uh, yellow and black stripes. The adult looks very like a, uh, a wasp or a bee uh, that's feeding on a, a plant there, it's just taking nectar. But it lays eggs on the, on, the, on the leaf and there is a larva that develops from it and that grow, grabs hold of a green fly with two very sh sharp hook-like mouth parts and then sucks it dry and then spits out the empty shell of the aphid. And that again will take about 50 aphids a day, which is a powerful lot better than your spray, so it is. And that will just move from day, you know, from one plant to another and wipe out the green fly. There's another type of uh, hoverfly as well called the drone fly. Uh, this looks very like a drone honeybee, but it's only got two wings. Honeybees have got four wings. Uh, it is quite a, a bulky looking insect. It sounds like a honeybee and looks like a honeybee, but it's a fly. But again, it's beneficial. It uh, pollinates, uh, goes from floor to floor. But its grubs are completely different. They're called rat-tailed maggots and they lay their eggs in slurry tanks or heavily polluted with animal manure water. And the big long rat tail is actually its breathing tube and that can be up to two to three inches in length and it protrudes it above the surface of the water and can breathe in fresh air. Well, can breathe in oxygen, I won't say it's all that fresh, but that's how it gets its oxygen because the pollution inside the septic tank or the uh, slurry tank, if there's no oxygen at all, so it's got to breathe externally. I get these in my water butt quite often, along with mosquitoes. Um, I have a fairly good uh, water butt, and I encourage these things to come in by putting a bit of uh, 
horse mirroring to encourage them to come into it. So it's nice to see those. Water pots are again a good source of uh, water for things to come down and, and take water from, but you can get uh, things living in too. So water butts are another source of biodiversity for your garden. If you can't afford a pond, get a water butt. Some of the pretty, prettier creatures, again, quite a pretty creature, but there's a larvae there ripping apart a caterpillar. Fierce mouth parts, and that will just strip that caterpillar down to nothing. It's called an ant lion. It is a very fierce predator of caterpillars and green fly as well. But the adult is one of the prettiest creatures of all. This is a golden eyed lace wing, and the, the eye is actually shining gold. And the lace wing name comes from its very pretty wings. Just looks like lace patterns all through the wings there and completely see through. But again, these will eat the eggs of aphids. They'll go for aphid uh, nymphs as well. Very pretty wee creature. Hawthorn seal bugs. Um, you'll see these during the autumn time when the berries are on the trees. Uh, they are bugs, so they pierce through into the leaf itself and suck out the sap and they'll feed on the hall berries as well. And that's just a young nymph. So they are pests up to a certain degree, but they don't do harm, don't do an awful lot of damage. They won't kill the plant off, they simply uh, suck sap from it. But they're very nice creatures to see. They're called a shield bug because of the obvious shape of a shield. Pretty shoulders to it. Then we'll come across earwigs. These are actually green fly predators, so they'll eat green fly. They grab hold of the green fly with their pincers and then squeeze it and kill it, then turn around and eat the squashed up green fly. So they're actually good, they're very beneficial in the, in the garden situation. They'll eat eggs of green fly as well or young ones. And they can fly. The original names were ear wings because their wings are in the shape of an ear. But for some reason, they got downgraded to ear wig. But they, are, they can fly in warmer countries. They're very maternal. They'll lay their eggs under logs and things like that. And if you spread the eggs out, the parent will actually pick up each egg individually and bring them back into a little batch, into a little colony. <coughs> One thing I found was up in the a polycillin plot was working on, and there in the middle of it is a, this is a polycillin road. There now is a green grasshopper. I think that what that plant was. Might be a raspberry plant or something. But it's amazing what you find in your local gardens. Grasshoppers are not all that common. You find them out in rural areas, Mary, not, not in urban, but it's been flown, it's been up in the wing, the wind, the wind's probably blown it in. On the spiders, Love them or loathe them. I know you saw all your different opinions about these. Uh, this is the one that causes all the problem in autumn time, the, the big house spider. Uh, the ones you see normally are males. This is a female. Uh, the males have a, like a boxing glove uh, mouth parts at the front there. And the males come in looking for the females who are there already. They're established in a nice coolish sort of room. The males come in looking for a bit of love and attention, well, more love than anything else. And unfortunately, he gets trapped in baths quite often. He can't climb out the smooth surfaces of the bath, so he keeps sliding backwards. Unfortunately, if he does find a female mate and has his way, wicked way with her, uh, she will then bite him and eat him. And that provides food for the, the gen, next generation that comes along. So, you know, he, he takes her, he, he has his wicked way with her first and then has dinner. Well, he is the dinner, so he is. And the female will often hibernate and then produce the eggs next year, and that sustains the infestation. Uh, nowadays, a lot of people have laminate floors or wooden floors. You can actually hear them across the floors at little feet. They run at 15, mile, 15 kilometers an hour. And in the old days, we had carpets which disguised them. They couldn't, you couldn't see them or you couldn't hear them. But now they're becoming more and more obvious. Um, you can be sitting reading a book or newspaper and you see this thing strewn along the, the, wood, uh, the, the skirting board and you think, is that a mouse? And says, no, it's a big spider and it is quite scary. But if you ever see one with a cat in its mouth, that's when you want to get worried. They can live for four or five years, up to seven years in the laboratories. I have one in the garage, which is, it's at least five years old now. I've been blue balls very so often. 
uh, outside now, but they're good, they eat moths, flies, all that sort of thing. So if you didn't have spiders, you'd have enough more problems with flies. This brown reddish one here on the right hand side is a wood a woodlouse beetle or woodlouse spider, and it grabs hold of slaters or wood lice and rips them apart with those big fierce uh, mouth parts of the front. So it's a pest in so much as it's killing off wood lice, which are beneficial, but it doesn't do us enough, it doesn't do us any harm. Although, again, if the mouth parts were infected and the bit us or a youngster, it could cause an infection in the skin. And then down the bottom, there's a, a fairly common typical garden species, the orb spider again. It forms its web in the shape of an orb between two bushes quite often across a path. If you walk through the bush or th through the, the web and break it, within 40 minutes, they'll have it repaired again. So these come in all sorts of colors. You get this drab, gray and black one. You also come in red, yellow, and even greens. All the same species, but quite a nice, pretty creature. See some people scratching already. Anna, you're scratching your back of your head again. <laughs> you do like spiders. Um, we're also again new spiders coming in. Uh, I was down in Drocada last week inspecting a place. And if, can I show it? I'll show it at the end. I have a, I have a false black coat of spider there, which are now very common down the south of Ireland and moving the way up here. They're supposed to be up here as well, but uh, it's one to look out for. It, the, its bite is probably five times worse than a bear wall sting. So it's one to look out for in the future. Well, now in fact. Uh, these two I've just put in, fire brats and silverfish. You get them in the households quite often in darkest rooms, but you find them quite often in garages or potting sheds or greenhouses. They like dark, damp conditions, uh, completely harmless to us, and they're, they're scavengers of eat any crumbs and things about the place. They don't do plants any harm either, but they're just an indicator of, of really damp conditions. Ants, black ants especially, you'll find them on the nests underground, usually around the bases of uh, rose trees, where the foliage has uh, been waving around in the wind and creates a hole around the, the stem of the plant. They fall that hole down and then from the nest underneath there. They don't do as much harm. They like sweet substances. So unfortunately, they might come indoors for water or for, for sweet substances like honey or jam even. So you might get them coming indoors, but they don't do harm to the plants outside. They will eat, they will utilize aphids as well. So they're a beneficial. Wasps, another extremely beneficial pest control. Uh, the ordinary tree wasp, which we have come across, uh, the common wasp, they have these massive big nests made of uh, pyramache. They go to a, tr a tree and scrape the bark off it, mash it up, and then form these scalped structures here. This is all made out of chopped up paper. So it's a very good insulation uh, to heat, keep the heat in. It is not very weatherproof, unfortunately, which is why you find them in roof spaces or in trees or underground quite often. Uh, bees and wasps are the only two insects that can kill people in the UK. They do kill eight to 10 people every year, but they are beneficial um, in that they, they're, they eat insect larvae of all sorts and adults. So the tree wasp is a very, very good beneficial pest control in your garden. So if you come across them, if they're not doing you any harm or they're in a place which isn't causing any problems at all, cordon it off, keep kids away from it because you know what the kids are like, they get a stick and poke it until the wasps start to come out and there will be covered wasp stings and it could do a lot of harm. So uh, warn them they're not uh, to go near the wasp nest. I'll try to try to disguise that so that you know kids, if you tell kids not to do something, they will do it unfortunately. But wasps, um, uh, there's about 5,000 wasps in one nest at any one time. Honeybees have about 50,000 bees at any one time during the summertime. So in this case here we've got, well, there's also parasitic wasps I mentioned before. These things lay their eggs inside the grubs. There's some caterpillars underneath the stem there and that will actually push its egg laying tube through the tissue into the caterpillar, lays egg inside it. There's one attacking a white fly, it's a white fly pupae, and 
the egg hatches out into another larvae, which then eats all the goodies, all the goodies inside the, uh, the caterpillar or the pupil case there. There's one attacking soft fly and one on green fly as well, tiny wee green fly. These are microscopic ones here. This is quite a big thing, but you get these microscopic uh, parasitic wasps. Bumblebees and honeybees, very, very important uh, pollinators. We're losing them, unfortunately, through disease, loss of habitat, that sort of thing. As I said before, during the summertime, there's up to 50,000 bees in a hive. Over the wintertime, there are no babies to feed, so that reduces us down about 10,000 honeybees. But they fill all those, all those wee holes, all those wee cells with honey to sustain them over the wintertime. That's why we get our honey. Beekeepers knock the bees off, steal their honey, and then place it with fondant as a substitute. And then you've got the bumblebees, lovely uh, furry black and yellow stripes to it, cuddly sort of things. Talk about bumblebees a bit more. Yellow banding, you get common bumblebees, buff-tailed, red-tailed. They are social insects and they can live in colonies underground uh, with 10 to 20 workers. They will use or utilize old mouse holes or any holes in the ground at all. Uh, the lay a dozen eggs or so, which turn into sterile females, which are the workers for the rest of their lives. The workers gather pollen and nectar, and that feeds the, the grubs inside the nest itself. And at the end of the season, uh, all the old males, workers, and queens die off. Only the new queens, which have been fertilized, they, they're the ones that hibernate. It's the same with the wasp nest, only the new queens hibernate. The nest is completely wiped out. Uh, and honeybees, a honeybee hive can last for five to seven years. It's made out of wax, so it's more sustainable. Whereas the wasp nest is only made out of paper. One year does it, and that's it finished. Bumblebees aren't aggressive, although I've been stung five or six times as I've picked them up. Um, and they are extremely important pollinators of plants and fruit trees. And there's a small bumblebee nest. These are what are called hon uh, honey balls and they are full of honey and nectar. I've eaten one uh, without the larvae, and they are quite sweet and nutritious. Uh, they lay their eggs on the outside of it. The larvae burrows through the, the wall of the honey ball and feeds on the nectar and on the inside there. If I find these on hay beetles uh, and, old wasp, and old mouse holes as well. Then you get these things called mining or solitary bees. They form like little volcanoes in sandy soil. And there's a little entrance hole there, or exit hole, where they go down there and form galleries under the ground there and lay their eggs in there and provide nectar and pollen to sustain their young. They're a bit smaller than honeybees. I can see the, the pollination work they're doing there. Their legs and their body are covered in pollen. And then some examples of insect or bee shelters. Uh, the more holes you can get, the better. Uh, ladybirds and bees will both use these to shelter over winter the time, uh, over the winter time. If you didn't have these, they'd have to make their own holes to, to shelter in. Um, these are very, very beneficial for, for uh, and where, where you place them, why build them? Uh, Honeybees need as much shelter as they can get. They've lost their natural habitat and there's pesticides and all the rest of it. So if you can provide spaces for them to hibernate over the winter time, the better. It gives them a bit of a chance to survive the winter time. If there's no shelter for them, they'll die off in the cold. And where you put them? During the summertime and full sun facing the south or southeast, keep it at least a meter of the ground with no vegetation near the entrance. Keep it dry otherwise they'll go mouldy. You can attach it to a wall or a fence, but because it's only a temporary thing, you'll need to move it into um, a coolish space, protect it indoors, into a shed or something like that, so it's not uh, open to the elements for the winter time, making rain, snow. So if you can put it in the shed, you will be still full of overwintering bees or ladybirds, and then you, you do that from about October to February time, and then put outside again once the spring comes through. They will not emerge until the daylight hours are right. It doesn't go by temperature all the time. They are, the, the daylight hours have to be long enough for them to stay in 
uh, food. If ladybirds out, come out too early in the, in the summertime or in the, in the sunny days, there's no food for them, there's no green fly, they'll actually starve before they get back into their, their shelter again. Um, when mentioned about butterfly hotels, these can be a buffet for mice and spiders, but once the butterflies go into the uh, butterfly hotels, seal them up with mesh to stop predators coming into it. Because if a spider gets into a butterfly hotel, it's just a, a buffet for them, so it is. Some other predatory creatures in the garden, centipedes. Uh, there are actually poison, there's venomous fangs on the centipede there. So it injects venom into its prey, which helps to digest. It's an enzyme that helps to digest it and then chops it to pieces. They come all sizes and lengths. A centipede is supposed to have 100 legs. It's actually got about 37 pairs of legs. And there's one there guarding its little egg box down there. Come very, very long ones, flat ones. Then you've got your millipedes. These are great decomposers. Unfortunately, they do nip off emerging seedlings as well. So there's a spotted millipede there. Let's see what it's called, spotted millipede. Flat millipedes. The black millipedes are the most common one you find in the garden. Unfortunately, they give off a smell, an aggregation smell, which attracts more and more to one place. So this is literally thousands of millipedes all attracted to one spot at somebody's front door. I fill them up and I fill a bucket. There were so many of them. So a whole bucket full of them. Um, they, they are decomposers. They'll, they'll go for rotting vegetation, um, but any emerging seedlings they will pick up as well. This is quite an interesting one too. This is a pill, mill, a pill millipede, and it's got yellow and black stripes. If it is uh, attacked or touched at all, it goes into this sort of armadillo shape uh, for protection and it can roll away. Quite nice sweet creatures. Wood lice, again, not many people are too fond of these. There's the, the mummy there and little babies, which are laid as live young. These are crustaceans, no, they're not insects. Um, they have a very tough outer, outer skeleton there, which, uh, which is susceptible to drying out which is why you find them under rotting wood and stones. But they help to break down, their decomposers, they help to break down wood, which is stored to rot. And you can see here, you find them in their hundreds in one spot. But the conditions that are right, you get loads and loads of things gathering together for food and shelter. Another bane of gardeners is slugs and snails, uh, extremely bad plant pests, uh, but uh, they're food for hedgehogs and birds, so you know they've got some good size of them. I tried to advise against using slug pellets that are poisonous. You can buy slug pellets which are desiccants, that desiccate, that dry out the slug rather than actually kill it. So I would rather go for those because that doesn't harm the birds or the hedgehogs. Uh, the lay eggs, these white translucent eggs, in batches of maybe 100 to 200 at a time, and they will go around. Uh, they'll hide under stones and, and logs and under pots as well. If I'm changing pots, I always look for slugs to make sure I get, get rid of them all and squash them. During the autumn time, I go out and collect 50 slugs at a time in a jam jar and then pour on very, very hot salted water and it kills them almost immediately. And I do that uh, for six or seven nights in a row until I can't find any more. And it's amazing if you're picking up 50 a night for six nights, you can pick up 300 slugs in a week. And that is a big benefit to your garden. And I give myself a glass of whiskey after I've done that as a, as a reward. <laughs> so everybody wins then. But again, slugs and snails are they're great food for, for birds and for um, sl uh, hedgehogs and frogs as well. So you know, it's a food source in the, in the Unfortunately, this is the one thing that does no good at all. It's an exotic flatworm from New Zealand. It came in, in the 1960s into Belfast, and it spread throughout Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland as well. There's the Australian version there down below it, but this big one, the New Zealand one, feeds on earthworms only. It can grow up to about eight inches in length, it comes out nighttime, so birds don't get a chance to prey on it, and it also produces an enzyme which burns the mouth parts of the bird too. So they try it once and don't do it again. Normally they'll find it 
curled up on a bed of slime like this, under stones, under logs, under plastic bags, even under uh, tomato bag, grow, grow bags. So they emerge from that moment and they, at night time and they go out and eat earthworms. All earthworm species are eaten. We have 23 earthworm species throughout Ireland. They're not fussy. They will eat anyone they can. And over here are the eggs. They're black shiny things the size of a small pea. And they will hatch into between five and 15 young ones at a time. So if you come across these, cut them in half, put them in boiling water, kill them because they will destroy your soil structure. If they wipe out all the earthworms in your garden, your soil will, will uh, deteriorate quite quickly. Earthworms aerate the soil, they drain the soil and bring back nutrients into the soil. These things, the flatworms do nothing beneficial at all. They don't even burrow. They go down the earthworm burrow and catch the earthworm down below and kill it and eat it down below. So if you come across these, they're very, very widespread, very common in Belfast. They're common throughout the whole of Northern Ireland now, unfortunately. And down south, you also get these big ones, the strange sort of pinky ones. That's the size of those things. They're only about an inch in length. But you'll, you'll see these things. They're liver colored on the top with a pale band around the outside. I studied for 15 years and got to New Zealand for three weeks uh, work. So that did me a lot of good too. So just a few slides to cheer you up. Uh, just showing bird, there's a bee eater, which we don't have in Northern Ireland yet, but we live in hope. It's on the nice feet of a, of a dragonfly. Strange food chain, slugs are eaten by the frogs, and then the frogs are eaten by bats. So uh, we don't have that sort of bat here, I don't think yet, but uh, we live in hope. And if you think of that food chain at the start, you have the predators at the right top of the food chain, uh, rooms like voles and small mice eat insects and slugs and things. So if you damage those, the birds and things higher up uh, lose out as well. So baby owls, they've, they're fed voles and mice at the start of their lives. So you have to think of the things for the, ch the chain. Don't think of yourselves. And hopefully one day we'll see on the, there's a prime office on a deep rail of its own down the street. So maybe one day with good climate change we might see one of these. So on that point I shall finish and I'll turn over to Anna. Brilliant Paul, thanks a million for that and I mean I think everyone would agree that you know your knowledge is second to none. Uh, you know you have obviously spent your lifetime you know doing the research into this and it's, it's a passion for you. You can see you know that it is a real passion. Um, I'd just like to open the floor to anyone if anybody has any particular questions for Paul. Now, if you don't want to speak, you can certainly type them into the chat. I can pick them up.